Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for this discussion on climate change, poverty, and race. We have um, some really wise heads that are going to join us in a minute to talk about this really important topic. And we're looking forward to uh, where we go over the course of the evening as we investigate how these different serious things interact with each other and what it means for us as Christians as we live in this complicated world. So my name is Jeremy Williams, and I am a writer and activist, and I recently wrote this book, um, Climate Change is Racist, Race, Privilege, and the Struggle for Climate Justice. And some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about this evening is based on the book. Um, I also write uh, the blog, The Earthbound Report, and I'm very active here in Luton. I run something called Zero Carbon Luton, and um, I'm a member of Stopsy Baptist Church, and I also run an outdoor church that meets in the woods. Um, but I'm going to let the rest of the panel introduce themselves. They're going to do that uh, better than I will. So let me invite um, Philip to step up next and introduce himself. Hi, Jeremy. Uh, good to be joining this evening with our distinguished panel. Uh, I'm Philip Powell, and I work in Tier Fund as the Theology and Network Engagement Manager for the UK. But I also wear another hat, which is the uh, being the co-director of the Justice Conference, and I'm sure um, you will be able to hear more about the Justice Conference uh, in the in the information that has been put up. Um, besides that, I originally come from India, and I live here in the UK. And reading Jeremy's book uh, absolutely blew me away. Uh, as somebody who has been in the justice scene for over two decades, it literally uh, brought me to tears reading what Jeremy has written about the connection between climate change and the element, the underlying racism. So I'm really looking forward to this evening and also sort of engaging with some of your questions. So it's good to be here, Jeremy, and joining you this evening. Thank you. Um, Grace. Hello, um, my name is Grace. I recently graduated from the University of York studying human geography and environment. And other than being an, uh, an activist and um, quite fond of environmental theology, I now work for an amazing organization called Just Love UK, which wants to um, release and inspire every Christian student to pursue the biblical call to social justice. And I also Great. did my dissertation on um, exploring the environmental concerns of black Christians for my dissertation, which has been really incredible. Thank you, welcome Grace. And Jessica, you're next. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, hi to everyone. Uh, I know obviously we are watching from different parts of the world. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone tuned in. Uh, really happy that you could join us. I'm Jessica Bwali. I am from Zambia. I'm a climate activist and I also work for Tier Fund. I'm the Global Campaigns Associate. And I'm really happy that we'll be able to have such a very um, amazing conversation uh today and i'm so glad that uh, a lot of people will actually be following thank you so much jeremy thank you jessica welcome and robert yeah good evening everybody my name is robert beckford i am the professor of climate and social justice at the university of winchester also the professor of black theology at the queen's ecumenical foundation in birmingham and professor of theology at vu university in amsterdam as well as being a a broadcaster and also um, filmmaker. So it's a real privilege to be here um, amongst such a fantastic array of um, talent and guests and experts. And I too was very much moved by Jeremy's book. It gave voice to a long history of exploitation. And um, I'm really looking forward to discussing it in more detail this evening. So thank you again for inviting me. Great, thank you, welcome. <clears throat> so what we're gonna do next, um, we're going to open in prayer and commit our, our conversation to God over the next hour and a half or so. And uh, Jessica has volunteered to pray for us. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Um, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you for this day that you saw it fit that uh, we meet in such a manner. I'd like to say thank you to each and every person that's joining us from across
front line of uh, uh, the effects of climate crisis. I hope that uh, even as we discuss, we'll be able to bring hope uh, to the people and also that uh, everything that we're going to discuss will be able to uh, be used for good around the world. Thank you uh, for Jeremy uh, that uh, you um, gave the wisdom to come up with this amazing book. And uh, I pray that this book will be able to just reach to the furthest uh, of uh, this world. And as we start this discussion, may you be with each one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jessica. <clears throat> now then, um, we on the panel have all had a chance to read the book. And maybe some of you who are watching this evening have had a chance to read the book as well. But not everyone will have done. And so what we want to do next is we want to show a video. It's actually from Greenpeace. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's a really good summary of the arguments that are contained in the book um, and some of the issues um, around how climate and race intersect. So we're going to start off with that. <clears throat> and that will really introduce what we want to talk about. And then we'll come back afterwards. Is climate change racist? Well, nobody is saying hurricanes, heat waves, or rising sea levels are prejudice, but we can't ignore the fact that people who've often been on the front line of climate related disasters have been people of color. Sadly, the reality is that the climate crisis has been impacting people of color for years. There are a lot of complicated reasons as to why. The simple version is this. The lives of people in countries across Africa and Asia, as well as indigenous peoples all over the world, have been deliberately ignored and devalued by massive corporations and countries in the West for centuries. This is happening because a greater value has been placed on money and power than on some human lives. And this is not about the past. The climate crisis is still impacting different groups of people around the world with very different degrees of severity. Today, people who already hold less power around the world like women and people of color, are far more likely to experience the catastrophic effects of climate breakdown. When we say catastrophic, we're talking flooding, heat waves, drought, wildfires, rising sea levels, all of which ultimately make it difficult for people affected to access food, shelter, and other basic human needs. So what's the reason for this imbalance? Extreme effects of climate breakdown are mostly felt in developing countries like Indonesia, Colombia, and Kenya, often referred to as the global south. The UN has recently said that there is, on average, one climate crisis disaster, like heat waves, storms, or flooding, occurring worldwide every week, and most of those are occurring in the global south. The climate crisis is rarely mentioned as a cause of these disasters when they're reported on the news. But the truth is, extreme weather events are getting more frequent and intense as a result of climate breakdown. Just look at Bangladesh, which has been one of the countries hit hardest. Bangladesh's low-lying coast has meant that it's particularly prone to flooding and cyclones, and climate breakdown has meant these events are happening more often and more severely. In 2020, the country's coastline was battered by Cyclone Anthem, the most powerful cyclone it's faced in 20 years. It's estimated that by 2050, one in every seven people there will have been displaced by climate change. And here's the kicker. The people most affected are also much less likely to have contributed to the problem in the first place. Researchers at Oxfam found that someone in the UK will take just five days to emit the same carbon as someone in Rwanda does in an entire year. By the 12th of January every year, the average Brit's emissions will have overtaken the annual per capita emissions of a further six African countries. Malawi, Ethiopia, Uganda, Madagascar, Guinea, and Burkina Faso. But this isn't about blaming people who occasionally forget to switch the kitchen lights off or who take one family holiday a year. There are a handful of companies causing the vast majority of damage to the planet. In 2017, the Carbon Majors Report identified 100 companies that had contributed to 71% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions since 1988. Some of the worst offenders are BP, Shell, and ExxonMobil. Let's take a quick detour to see who's personally profiting from the climate crisis. Wow, the oil and automobile CEO community sure is a rich and diverse tapestry. In short, the global north, including countries like the US and the UK, is for the most part creating this mess. 
and the global south is having to deal with it. And the climate crisis isn't just happening far away, it's affecting communities right here in the UK. Black, African and Caribbean people are exposed to higher levels of illegal air pollution than any other ethnic group in the UK. This isn't an accident. People of colour in Europe and North America are more likely to live in bad quality housing in built up areas and are far more likely to work in industries where they're more exposed to pollution due to structural racism. So if we're serious about tackling racism and climate change, we should start to address the huge inequalities and injustices that people of colour face right here in the UK too. While people of colour in the Global South are at the front line of climate-related impacts, they've also been the first to resist environmental destruction. Indigenous knowledge has been key to conserving the planet so far. For thousands of years, people of colour have lived in harmony with nature by practising sustainable farming and effective fire and waste management techniques, which are often more friendly to the planet than industrial solutions. They are also on the front line of the global fight to save the natural world. Although people of colour in the Global South have been champions of the planet for thousands of years, they now have fewer resources, like infrastructure, to deal with the impacts of the changing climate. The cause of this inequality is racism which goes back hundreds of years. Something a lot of these countries have in common is long histories of colonial rule, during which their resources, land and labour were stolen by European colonisers. Their thriving societies and economies were reshaped to benefit European empires, which means that the legacy of colonialism is alive and well today. From trade systems that have been set up to favour Western countries, to foreign and multinational corporations continuing to pillage local territories and resources in the global south through extractive industries like mining and fast fashion. These structural inequalities leave countries in the global south less able to deal with climate disasters when they happen. So race is a big factor in how people experience climate change. But the structural inequalities don't end there. Gender, sexuality, age, disability and more can also play a part. The unfortunate truth is that the climate crisis is affecting people who are already marginalised far more. That means it's impossible for us to talk about the climate breakdown without talking about inequality, because one is crucial to our understanding of the other. We must call on governments and corporations to tackle the climate emergency urgently, and in the process, help to correct these ingrained inequalities to create better, more equal societies. So there we have it. Climate change isn't racist, but people still are. Politicians, corporations and entire countries in the global north have been and continue to be responsible for people of colour paying the price for the climate emergency. That's why the climate crisis is a race issue. We can't win the fight against climate chaos without dealing with racism. Find out how you can take action. Click the links below and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. Thanks for watching. Please share this video. Great, thank you to Greenpeace for that uh, very succinct summary of uh, the issues that the book deals with. <clears throat> but let me put this to the panel. We have this title, Climate Change is Racist, which is a somewhat provocative title, perhaps. <laughs> How do you understand the connection between climate and race? Let's put this panel, this, this to everyone on the panel, one at a time, and um, see what perspective you want to bring to that issue. Um, Grace, why don't you kick us off on that question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so especially with my degree that I've just finished, um, it's been really interesting learning about um, environmental um, racism on my own terms. Um, and I experience environmental racism every day living on a major road in Bradford. Um, and I feel really frustrated about the lack of information about the health risks, about being exposed to high levels of air pollution and not being able to access green spaces. Um, to people at home, um, I would definitely recommend doing um, this. So there's this website called um, addresspollution.org where you can like um, put in your postcode and see the levels of air pollution in where you, um, where you live. And when I put my address in the website, um, my address was the 98th national percentile, which means it's very, very high air pollution in comparison to the rest of the UK. And that's the reality of um, my life living in council housing and this is the reality of many um, ethnic minorities living in the UK who are mm. prone to um, these issues due to structural racism and just like life in general. So yeah that's kind of like my perspective of how um, climate and also um, race um, link. <clears throat> Thank you, that, I think that's a really important point that the video mentions just in passing that this is a global injustice but environmental racism is something that we see 
in the UK as well, in our cities in particular. That whole issue of air pollution in particular, we see that in Luton as well. Um, Philip, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you see the connection between climate and race? Thank you, Jeremy. Um, as a brown man who has come from India to live in the UK, um, I've had to deal with racism in all sorts of different ways, including when you have to go and get a visa to travel somewhere, to being asked to show your papers on a train when you're traveling into Germany. Uh, but what I want to say is it was already a complicated, challenging, demanding issue, racism. And then suddenly, you know, reading your book on climate change and, and realizing that the racist underpinning of what is going on in the climate uh, crisis, it's sort of, it's like, it's almost like it added another layer of complexity to the racism issue. But as I read the book and as I was trying to think through this, I was like, yeah, that's right. The reason um, many Western countries are dragging their feet is because the people that are affected by the climate crisis are not immediately at the moment white people. So it, it almost like it was like it was like the penny was like, yeah, obviously, if COP um, uh, is not delivering, it's because the primary targets, primary victims of the situation are not white people. I mean, you write in your book about Ebola and, and, and how when, you know, there was one case of Ebola in the US, suddenly there was like this availability of uh, the, 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 the vaccines and stuff like that. But what I do want to say is that there is a different sense in which the agency for dealing with the climate crisis does not lie exclusively with white people or people in the global north. Mm. There's a sense in which people in Zambia or Kenya who have been victims of um, the climate crisis can also participate in some way, seeing us move in a different direction. So there, there is an element in which that agency can be empowering. And, I, and that, that's the hope that I bring to this issue. Yeah, I'll stop there. Back to you, Jeremy. <laughs> yes, thank you. No, I think that's really important. Um, I think the last thing we need is white people such as myself casting ourselves as the saviors who are now going to rescue the world from climate change after we caused it in the first place. Um, Robert, would you like to add something to that question? Yeah, yeah, I want to take a completely different mm -hmm. twist on this. Look, we know climate change is racist because it just exact climate change exacerbates pre-existing inequalities, both in terms of history, colonization, and also more recent post-colonial history, migration to Britain and the impact on health, housing, education for black and brown people. So it just exacerbates what's already there in terms of the past and in the present. But that's something new. And I want to say, look, the real issue why climate change is racist is because of the continuity of white worldwide white supremacy. It's that simple. And if we're talking about worldwide white supremacy, we've also got to include Christianity within that because from colonization through to the present, Christian thought has been interwoven with maintaining white skin color privilege. So I would say climate change is racist because the Christian tradition has been primarily a racist discourse. So I wanna throw that in as well so that we triangulate climate change, race, but we can't ignore the way that Christian thought have perpetuated white supremacy, traditions of black inferiority, and therefore has fed into the current malaise that we face. Yeah, and that's a really interesting point. And we'll come back to, to theology a little bit later in the conversation. Um, Jessica, was there anything that you wanted to, to add to that question? Or, or would you like to move on to a, a different one, specifically about uh, your context in Zambia? Yeah, sure. Sure, OK. Um, <clears throat> It's great to have you joining us from Zambia. We're really glad that we have this uh, multinational panel uh, this evening. Can you tell us a little bit about what climate change looks like in Zambia and in um, other African countries around you? Yeah, uh, thank you, Jeremy. Um, so today in Zambia, our, um, our Independence Day is on the 24th of October. And let's say 10 years ago, this will be a day that we always had our face trains on the 24th and it never missed and this would happen like on the 24th uh but this has not been the story anymore it's been a whole different uh story we the meteorological department it's it's that bad to the point where the meteorological department in zambia cannot even predict the weather forecast because you're like, oh, we're going to have rains uh, maybe next day or two days uh, after. 
and it doesn't happen. So this has affected a lot of people. Uh, in Zambia, a lot of people are small scale farmers. And you can imagine um, a person that struggles to get uh, some seedlings just to go and plant uh, maize or any type of vegetables uh, because in their mind, they know that the rains are starting now and they get to plant and that does not happen. Uh, you know, so that will mean not only do they lose the money, but they actually don't get to have anything to 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 eat because what they were planting, they were hoping they could actually multiply from there and get to have something. So this is a story in Zambia and most countries in Africa. The weather pattern is unpredictable, has been unpredictable for a very long time. The drought is like when it rains, it rains to the point where it actually floods. If it's dry, it's not just like the normal dry, it actually get to drought. It's like super, super dry. And um, sometime last year, I had um, the privilege of shooting a short uh, film on climate crisis uh, effect. I keep on saying climate crisis because I personally feel it's no longer a change. This is its past being a change. This is a crisis now. In the, I, I went to the southern part of Zambia. Uh, the southern province and most of uh, people in southern province are livestock farmers and jeremy i went to a certain village called nzambale village when i was taken to a village i was told oh i explained what i wanted to do and everything i saw the dried up uh, fields and all and i was taken to a river so when we were going they actually mentioned the woman that was helping me was actually telling me to say Oh, this river has killed a lot of people. A lot of people, when you know it has rained, they they drown and they die. A lot of people have actually dry, died on this river. And we're walking. The next thing, I, I we like step into a ditch. So I'm hoping like we're still bypassing and getting to a river. And she tells me, "Oh, this is the place I was talking about." I'm like, "Oh, how do you mean? Is this the place that you mean? A lot of people have lost their lives uh, from?" She says, "Yes. When it rains, this is a full river." And at that time. Jeremy, it was just a ditch. Like I, we were stepping on the on the on the on the depth of the river, and it, it was dry. And what really caught my attention and broke my heart, this is something that when I talk about, I it's like I relieve that day over and over again. When we went a little bit further, I found a woman that I should believe she should have been in her eighties. And she was drawing water from a very shallow well. It's actually, I, I can't even call it a well. It's just like water surface. I don't know the word to even use. It was really, really shallow. And beside her, there was a head of Kato that was obviously waiting for her to move. And it could actually come and drink. And this is a picture. And the, here's the thing. I was taking, I was fuming. I'm there. I'm just like oh, this is an old woman drinking water from, from this shallow well. And later when I got home, when I was putting the footage together, I was like, this is not right. This is wrong at every level. You know, because, and you can imagine this woman was not from the near uh, uh, river. It shows like she came from a very far away place to just come and draw that water. And nearby there's a school where when it gets to that place, when it's dry, they can't go to school because there's like for girls, there's no hygiene for them. There's no water. There's no way that a girl child could go to school and there's no water, you know, and also we need water for literally everything. So that is just a little snippet of what is happening in African countries. And I've spoken specifically about Zambia and this experience, because this is something I experienced firsthand. So when mm -hmm. we talk about climate crisis, when we talk about climate change, this is something you have to look at. And now here is the kicker. That person, that old woman getting to find herself to draw water, because I'm certain I may not have had that conversation for too long to ask how long that has been happening, but I'm sure she could tell me 20 years ago, that was not the case. Obviously, they would draw water from wherever because it was, you know, in excess. So now imagine somebody being in a position where they do not even understand why they are there. Why? Because they don't contribute to any, they have not contributed to any factor to get to where they are. They've not contributed to any factor for, for, for the weather to change. There is somebody somewhere who feels it's all right to do certain things. Uh, and yet the people that are suffering the consequences have zero to less or have actually less to zero factor contribution to the situation. And this is what's happening. 
a lot of people they don't even understand why we've, we've gotten to a point where the the it's a crisis the, the climate has changed because they, ha- they they don't there's nothing that they're doing to even contribute even zero percent to the carbon emission zambia itself as a country a whole country we contribute 0.002 percent of carbon emission but you can mm. imagine a woman an old woman in that state very vulnerable she's experiencing all that because somebody else is being selfish out there so i've specifically no trickle down to that to this story of one woman to just give an idea of the many this this maybe is a less story of what's happening in other african countries of what's happening even also in my country so that is a picture i could give somebody that may not be in places where the effects of climate crisis are so much a place like zambia or any other countries in africa so this is i i hope it is it is clear, like the picture is clear enough to just give you an idea of what's happening. It's, it's the loss has, has the damage has been done. It's really, really yeah. uh, too much. My hope is that uh, moving forward, uh, we can actually, uh, you know, uh, do certain things to just help with the adaptation and also just mitigate some of these things that are happening. And also with the coming in of COP, mm-hmm. I won't say much, but I'm hoping that this will help this type of conversations. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you. I think that's a really good example of of what the climate crisis means in such practical terms, because Mm -hmm. if I need water, I walk through into the other room, I turn on the tap. And that's exactly what we're talking about when we talk about privilege and climate privilege and the decisions that are being made about how climate change is going to unfold and how we respond to climate change. Those decisions being made by people who have all the luxuries of a modern consumer lifestyle, but the effects being felt by people who have so little. And Grace, I wonder if I can come to you next, because as that story demonstrates, Africa is the continent that is most affected by climate change. But those sorts of stories, those sorts of perspectives are often quite hard to find in climate change debate. How can we find more stories like that and amplify those sorts of stories? Yeah, great question. Um, Very similar to what uh, Jessica mentioned, but didn't go into much detail. We're like 16 days away from COP27. um, Mm. And, you know, we're (laughs) in comparison to like COP26, I'm just quite, you know, quite sad that there isn't that much, you know, publicity or like momentum. And, you know, it's a very Eurocentric comment for me to make that, oh, why is there not, you know, that much uh, momentum around it? But that's the whole point. Um, And if, you know, if COP27 is called, you know, the African COP because it's um, in Egypt this year, then how come are we not hearing, you know, um, as many, um, I guess, headlines um, about African activists and talking about what is happening um, in the continent? Um, And because of that, it's just really, really frustrating um, in the fact that I feel like for me as a young climate activist um, and just observing the climate justice movement, we see that a lot of people um, in the movement are white and middle class. But, you know, as Jessica Um, has mentioned that there are climate um, activists who are people of colour, but they're just not given the platform. And it's a question of why are they not given that platform? And, you know, with COP27 coming up, it's just kind of like thinking and just reading articles about are these climate activists actually getting, um, you know, the accessibility is there, are they getting the visas on time? Um, Are there, you know, actual opportunities for people who may not be the popular um, climate activists, like, you know, Vanessa Nakate, um, but you know, just the regular, um, regular individual who is working in the community to really um, improve the place. Um, so yeah, what can we do? Well, I was kind of like, you know, thinking about what I, how I kind of like interact with, you know, climate justice news and stuff like that. And we're very lucky and privileged here in the global north that we are not affected by the digital divide. So you know, using like um, social media, um, there's so many different. Um, activists from the global south who use their um, instagram platforms to kind of like showcase to campaign and all that kind of stuff and you know um the little things that we could do is you know repost um what they're um, showing and sharing because you know i think it's kind of encouraging that you know when we kind of like interact with what they are posting what they're sharing about what they're campaigning in their um, cities in the global south um that you know people um, around the world see them acknowledge that they um exist and we're standing in solidarity with them and it's also a great way for us to show and share with you know 
people um, in our close friends and circles who see our um, social media to actually see that, oh, actually, you know, this is quite interesting. I wouldn't be exposed to this kind of thing. Um, so yeah, things like that would be a great way to kind of like share more stories, but we just need mm. more um, spaces to actually have these kind of like platforms and discussions, which are clearly not happening, but we hope to see happen in COP27. Yeah. Yes, we'll come back to COP27 in a little bit. But um, <clears throat> I think one of the problems that we've seen with the COP is how uh, these old colonial power imbalances are affecting the way that we are responding to climate change. And uh, Robert, how do you see, you've mentioned it a little bit earlier, how do you see that colonial dynamic at work, do you think, in the COP process and in climate change response generally? Yeah, I think there are three things that happen. Firstly, we have um, Western domination. You're completely right. And it's the, the kind of privilege given to white skin uh, people from the Northern Hemisphere or Northern Hemisphere backgrounds, and they basically control the resources. It's what um, Latin American uh, theorists talk about when they talk about the world system, uh, the way in which power is um, hogged by the Northern Hemisphere and used to control the rest of the world. So that's the first thing that we've got to address. Second thing is we have to acknowledge that we've got some really, really weak leaders uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, you know, it, there, are, there are only a handful of people, maybe you could put them in the back of a mini car that you can trust to actually speak truth to power when it comes to standing up to Western powers. Think of Mia Motley, the Pr Prime Minister of Barbados during the last COP, being one of the few uh, leaders from the Southern Hemisphere, a black woman who would speak truth to power. So we've got domination from the Northern Hemisphere, really weak leadership um, in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, which means that we end up with the third, third thing is very little expectation from COP27. You know, so, so for me, the, re the result of the dynamic, Jeremy, is that there'll be lots of talking, but not lots of movement. And therefore, we need to think about what we can do radically to actually move things along in terms of Christian people and consider how the Christian tradition helps us to, to do that, both nationally and internationally. Yeah. Yes, well, that's an interesting point. So let's let's bring in the church at this point. And uh, Philip, um, we know that the church has played a very active role in these sort of vast injustices in the past. How can the church play a prophetic role in this whole issue of climate justice and, and racial justice as well, where they intersect? Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, I don't like to um, disagree with my fellow panelists, but I think I'm going to add something to what uh, Brother Robert had said earlier. Uh, I hope, uh, Brother Robert, you can then comment again uh, in, in response to what I've said. But I think we need to be careful when we say the church, because I think uh, when we when we are talking about this issue of racism, we're thinking about the church, the post-Reformation. We're not thinking about the Church of the East, the Syrian and Marthama Church from South India in Kerala. We're not thinking about the church that was there uh, in the time of Augustine in the Middle East. You know, when we say church, we need to think about the church in the last 2000 years. And for most of the history of the church, it was not led by people with white skin. You know, when you think of the church fathers like or Origen or uh, Cyril, these were not white people. And the problem with the Protestants is, is that we think that there was St. Paul and then there was nothing going on that was worthwhile. And then suddenly Martin Luther showed up and then we have church. And evangelicals, even worse, you know, we think there was St. Paul and then there was Billy Graham. But the history of the church is not primarily about people that had white skin color, just to let you know. And the church has tried to be faithful to Jesus over the centuries. And we've done terrible things. Of course, when you look at the modern period, we've done terrible things. But I think we need to be careful that we don't talk about the church like when we, we have the modern period in mind, but we talk about the church. The other thing I want to say as well is that and I come from India. You know, you have Hindu gods, Vishnu, Krishna, Lakshmi. And you see any visual representation of these gods, they all have white skin. Even the word caste is actually the Sanskrit word for color. And at the highest uh, caste, the Brahmins, they always have lighter skin. So I think we need to be careful that we don't... I, I, there, is a, there, is a, there is a clear condemnation we need to bring against the modern church, the, the modern Western church that has legitimized racism using Christianity. But there is a there is a more complex story to be told and remembered. Um, but what I think I want to say about uh, um, the church is that 
I still believe that um, Jesus wants his church to be the embodiment, the concrete manifestation of his good news. Real people living out ecological good news. You know, I walked around Luton in Luton picking up litter. Uh, we don't get it right, but the, but the, but the point is, the point I'm making is um, there has to be a way in which we condemn the wrong, but we also affirm the good. Yeah. Uh, that 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 we've done wrong, but we ask forgiveness for it. Um, and somehow the gospel is the gospel of reconciliation. While God has harsh things to say about injustice, if you, you read Amos, you read. Um, Hosea. But we know that Jesus talks about loving your enemies. And I think somewhere we need to remember that um, the church is called to be uh, the light and the salt of the earth. And I don't want to give up on that vision that Jesus has for his church. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think we have to give up on the vision. But I, I would, I would um, uh, say two things in response to what you said. First, Leo, for African people, people of African heritage like myself, we come into contact with Christianity in West Africa. There's a North African tradition that you've rightly mentioned, the, the Ethiopian Coptic church tradition. But, but from 1492, we've been in trouble since we've encountered Christianity. So we've got to talk about the reality of the last 500 years. And we're still waiting for an apology for the kind of things that Christianity did to us in the killing fields of the Caribbean, the killing fields of West Africa. We're still waiting for that reparation. So while we can believe in the radical tradition that Jesus talks about, the radical prophetic tradition of the Old Testament, we've got to get real about what's happened over the last 500 years. Now we can project back and ask similar questions because you mentioned origin. Origin doesn't have, to say, it doesn't have a nice thing to say about Ethiopians in its commentary. So issues about race and the position of black people within the Christian imagination goes right back. And that's why I'm saying we need to acknowledge the weaknesses within the Christian tradition. But yes, we can also acknowledge the moments, particularly in African diaspora history, civil rights movement, liberation movements, where the church has been at the forefront of transformation. But you also need to acknowledge that there's another dimension to this. Pentecostal talk about the spirit of God moves despite the church. So I'm interested in the way in which non-Christian groups have been the prophetic voice and continue to be the prophetic voice around the issues that we're talking about now. So yes, of course we believe in the gospel of reconciliation, but we're still waiting for that apology and reparation. And I would add the name Gandhi, who <clears throat> did not identify with the church, but was deeply committed to living out the teachings of Jesus in the gospel, who even wanted to lay down his life for his own enemies. So, of course, of course, um, and of course, I can't bring that apology, Robert, but, I'm, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm wanting us to believe that um, there is a need to put things right. But we have to hope and believe that uh, there will be uh, uh, a reckoning. There will be a reckoning, you know, and therefore uh, prophetic voices like you need to remind the church that you have failed to live the gospel and therefore we need to name it and condemn it. Yeah, Jeremy, back to you. Well, let me pick again at this point, because I think one of the, the practical ways that we can look towards this apology towards restoration and reparations is through the whole area of loss and damage and uh, climate finance and <clears throat> how that can help with both adaptation and uh, with mitigation of climate change and um, helping vulnerable countries and helping us in the West to take responsibility for our actions. Jessica, can you tell us a little bit about your work on climate finance? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, climate finance, just for the sake of uh, those people that may not uh, really understand uh, what it is. Uh, so climate finance, uh, we are talking about the money that could actually help uh, the people in the front line of uh, the effects of climate change. So this uh, finance, this money uh, we are talking about is a $100 billion that uh, um, sometime... Uh, 2019, 2020, the wealthy nations uh, pledged that they could actually uh, uh, be able to give uh, the vulnerable countries $100 billion uh, to help 
and 50% uh, for adaptation. And um, in my thinking, I've always thought, oh, obviously this was uh, come uh, to, to, to light because they thought, oh, we have done a number of things. We have done uh, maybe a lot of damages. So let's try and help uh, these countries that maybe have not uh, have not or have done little to, to um, uh, the crisis. But unfortunately, this has not happened. This has not happened since. This year, this is 2022, uh, and we're having COP27 uh, in, in, in Egypt, in Africa. I'm really hoping that this will be uh, a different type of COP. I'm really hoping, of course, like Grace mentioned, to say that this, uh, like, it's been uh, um, called the African COP. I'm really hoping that when the world leaders will be able to come to Africa, okay? It's unfortunate that maybe they, they may not step out of the offices and uh, go in the villages or go just in the nearest village in Egypt where they will be to just see the people that are in the front line of the effects of climate change. I think when sometimes I feel like it is easier when you get a first-hand uh, experience. You may not live that life, but maybe just seeing uh, what's going on, maybe it could actually just remind you to say this is not supposed to be right. So okay. how do I do? How what 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 what? Uh, 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 role should I play uh, to just try and you know do the right thing? And when I talk about the one hundred billion dollars, this is a this this is this this is not something that we applied for. Okay, this was a pledge, and it came about because somebody knew that it's their responsibility because of the certain activities, the certain uh, 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 things that they've been doing. So to think, oh, let us help. Like when we talk about, uh, Jeremy, you mentioned about loss and damage. We're looking at these things that will never be recovered. They, they lost infrastructure. They lost the washed away bridges. In, in, in worst case scenarios, the loss of lives, it will never be recovered. So if that $100 billion dollars uh, uh, climate finance is realized. I'm personally looking at a situation where I mentioned in Zambia, a lot of uh, people are small scale farmers. Let the farmers be able to learn. And I've also mentioned uh, how weather is unpredictable now. Why don't that $100 billion be channeled to uh, new skills for farmers, like the small scale farmers? Let them get to learn about different, uh, uh, you know, diversification in farming. They can learn about conservative farming. They can learn about what plants to, how to diversify. When we look at maybe plants that are weather resistant and so on. And for the young people, a lot of young people in Africa, the, the unfortunately, most countries, there's no employment. Let's look at the creation of green jobs. When we were watching the, the video earlier, uh, before we started speaking, we saw just how mo some of the, 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 the companies that are really contributing the worst, these are companies, we're talking, we, we, there's a part of you know, the fossil fuels that are actually happening around the world. So if that $100 billion is realized, it could actually help to do maybe to, 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 to bring about green jobs, you know, in, for the young people, so that at least not only will they sustain their lives, but also will be able to um, uh, protect the environment. There's a question. Uh, today, Jeremy, I was having a conversation with uh, uh, the BBC Africa on the same issue, and there was a conversation of, Oh, why are Africans thinking like we, they are owed this, you know, do we, or do we owe you this and so on? I'm like, this is an obligation. The fact that you sat down and thought about it and say, we need to help these countries. You knew why you got to that point. You knew the part that you're playing. So I, you, you, and also at the end of the day, when we get back, uh, I know like uh, when it comes to issues of climate, it affects all faiths. But when you talk about Christianity, for example, we are uh, told to, first of all, to take care of the earth and also to take care of, uh, protect each other, like take care of your, love your neighbors, you love yourself. So this is also something that we need faith to be, to be, uh, you know, to be uh, regained, uh, that, that trust to be regained. So if that 100, I hope that this will be one of the topics, the top topics that will be discussed in COP27. This should not just be one of those COPs where, oh, we meet, let's talk, we converse and everything. 
next people make their commitments and they go to their countries and they do nothing jeremy me right now to be honest um i, I would sign like me in personal capacity i would sign to uh, any i don't know if i can say a rule or a petition that actually says uh individuals countries organizations uh, or, or or whatever will be able to be sanctioned if they don't stick to the commitments that they make because we make a lot of commitments when it comes to cop a lot of them but when we look back let's go back what have you done there's literally nothing there are a lot of countries that have committed or oh, we are going to cut down on our carbon emission to this percentage but let's go back what have they done there's literally maybe no uh effort towards that commitment so let us and, try and to maybe, protect each other and maybe sure, that's but... the most important thing to acknowledge you know mm -hmm. many of these big oil companies they don't care you know they've been lying to us for a long period of time about the, the amount of carbon that they're spewing out they still want to take more stuff out of the ground we've had uh, a prime minister who just left here talked about going for growth and um, was was given granting licenses to to take more oil and gas out of the out of the earth you know we've got to acknowledge most of these countries most of these big businesses don't care they really don't care and coupled to that is a long tradition of not caring about african people so we've got, so what i'm saying is let's be historically realist about the predicament that we face and and mm -hmm. add to that the fact that according to the scientists we've only got 28 years to to pull this back and along that journey of 28 years there may be tipping points where we can't go back. So the best that we can be looking at now is questions of resilience and how we're going to contain the kind of cataclysmic disasters that are going to happen and the impact that's going to have on human life as well. So, I mean, th this is what the climate scientists are telling us at best. So I think, you know, we've got to think differently about the Christian imagination. What kind of radical ideas can we bring to bear on what the church needs to do in terms of radical lifestyle, in terms of radical thinking, in terms of reimagining what it means to be human, because from 1492, black people within the Christian imagination have been less than human. So we've got to. So, so for me, this provides us with an opportunity for some really radical thinking about what it means to be followers of the uh, of Jesus Christ. But I want to inject some realism. You know, we haven't got much time, and whatever they say at COP 27, we have to remember we haven't even got the technologies that they're talking about. We need. To solve the crisis so there's some so there's you know so we need to we need to move pretty quickly and open up our christian imaginations qu pretty quickly about what we need to do radically to cope with what's coming you know what Jer uh, jeremy sorry before you just come in just to echo on what robert has mentioned i feel most of the uh uh, I should. I. I. I'm gonna go to the leaders, the world leaders. I feel like they don't understand the agency of the crisis. Like this is an agent thing, and trust me, if nothing is done or maybe certain commitments that we've made are not realized, it's going to go down. It's been going down, but there is hope. There's something that we can do. We can try and mitigate. And for the the loss that has already been done, there could be some adaptation to it that could be made. But how do you go about that? That's the thing. We're looking at resources. And some people maybe don't even understand, Jeremy, that because of the climate crisis, there are young people like in, in most African countries that have, have had to be married off like at a really, really tender age. Well, I'm, when I talk to, I'm not talking about 16, I'm not talking about 15, I'm talking about some that are maybe 11, even 12, they've been married off simply because the family just realizes they can't sustain themselves anymore. So let us get some bride price, let us get a one or two cater from the neighbor, and here is a 50, 60 year old man who is willing to actually bring that, and that child is gone. You are cutting down the life of that child. Co talk about education you find that who is prioritized is the young the boy child now and the at the expense of the girl child simply because oh the girl child will take care of the family the girl child will do so it's 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 so broad if really we just try and do our part and commit to what we have laid down i feel we can there's something that we can do about this like there is there is hope that we might not have a lot of time by the time that we have we can utilize it to the best of our ability so that let's try and help with the mitigation. Let's try and help with the adaptation. If you cared, you wouldn't go in some people's livelihoods and say, oh, here they have they have a sea, let us mine in their sea. I mean, 
how you get the point so let us try and this time is not there but we can try and do something jeremy please take it up sorry yes <laughs> thank you thank you um we're going to come on in a minute and and hear from philip about uh, what what tier funds are doing in response to these sorts of things but before we do that grace can you tell us how you're working out some of these justice issues and responding to this need for a, a new prophetic imagination with the, with the students that you're working with? Yeah, oh, of course. Um, I just wanted to kind of like um, add on with um, just like how incredible your book has been for me um, as like a environmental activist. Um, and I really like when you kind of like articulate in your book um, about, you know, if it's true that climate change is predominantly caused by white people and disproportionately suffered by people of color, then we're in a racial atrocity um, and it demands that we take a stand. Because, you know, if not, you know, will we be silent like previous um, generations when it came to, you know, enabling slavery, apartheid or empire, or will we stand in solidarity? Um, and that's what's something that's really um, inspired me with like, you know, really um, working with students and being a student myself and just being part of the climate justice movement. Um, and I think it was very important for me to be part um, um, in, when I was a student in York to be part of it because, you know, being uh, not only black, but also Christian, I didn't really see myself um, in a lot of the circles and stuff like that. So I felt like I had to be a trailblazer. Um, and, you know, with the work that I'm doing now, I really hope that I can, you know, really rally up and try to diversify it and really get some more black Christians to really feel that they can participate, that they have a voice, they have a say, and that they're representing, you know, um, their nations back in the motherland um, and really making a difference in um, their, their own cities as well. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Now, um, Philip, I want to come to come on to you at this point because we've we've the conversation has been going on for a little while. There might be some people who are watching this as tier fund supporters who go, "I've always supported tier fund because it's about poverty." I'm not quite sure how tier fund is involved in climate change and also now in, in racial debates and racial justice. How does all of this tie together? And uh, and what is tier fund doing in, in response to these sorts of things? Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Um, yes, uh, Tier Fund is uh, the mission of Tier Fund is to go to where the need is greatest. Uh, our vision is to see people delivered and freed from poverty, living abundant lives. So, when Tier Fund started addressing the issue of the climate crisis, there were supporters that were alarmed who felt like, "I'm giving support to Tier Fund because you are helping people who are in poverty to." Um, find a way to get out of poverty and why are you doing this climate thing? But you begin to realize that the people that are the, the, the first victims of the climate crisis are people who are in poverty, the vulnerable in Bangladesh when there's flooding or when there's drought in East Africa. So Tier Fund had to make that, uh, take that step. And, and, and therefore um, now we know that many of the supporters that have journeyed with us know that Tier Fund we're talking about this issue long before other Christian churches started talking about climate issue and it sort of got the media profile that it has now. But the other element that you're we're talking about in this event this evening is how uh, the climate crisis has got this racial element. And that's even more challenging because if you look at the victims of the climate crisis, they are people who are brown and black people in, in parts of the world where they are, they didn't cause the problem and are, and are at the receiving end of the, the problem. So what Tier Fund has sought to do is, of course, one core conviction that Tier Fund has in our mission, in the in the work that we do, is we believe that the local church is God's agent for change. And so it's not about Western humanitarian agency coming in with this plan to top down impose solution. That's that's how development was done in the 80s. But now we believe that it is not about us here in the global north figuring out what the solution is and then imposing it on others who are in situations of need, but how do we work with the local children? Here, the South Up groups, which is about 15, 20 people, and there's, they're there in Nepal, they're there in uh, places around Africa, is how do you um, have that knowledge transfer, but also the accompaniment to be able to see people in these communities take ownership and see how they have the resources to see the transformation that we believe that, that is a sign that the kingdom of God is coming. And it's a very different mindset. And I think Tier Fund is committed to working with partners, committed to working with the local church. And for me, the self-help groups are actually not only just looking at solutions when we, Tier Fund, can be there. 
But even if Tier 1 were to leave, these things will continue. And that's a sign that transformation is taking taking root. And, it, and, and it's in agriculture, it's in small businesses. So there's a there's a whole range of things that we can talk about when it comes to self-help groups. But the, but the conviction behind it is that it can't be um, doing it for them. It is the agency is with the people who have been affected now being seeing themselves being able to be the agents of their own transformation. Back to you, Jeremy. I saw Robert nodding, so I'd love to hear what he was thinking. <laughs> well, I think before we get to that, and we'll come on to that in a minute, but um, we were going to watch a video uh, about the self-help help groups to give people a bit of a sense of um, what they're doing, how they work, and to hear from the people who are benefiting from them directly. Is, uh, is that video available to play? In Rwanda, agriculture is considered the backbone of the country's economy, contributing to a third of the gross domestic product. Despite massive investment from the government to modernize this sector, most farmers are still practicing subsistence agriculture, an approach that does not allow them to generate sufficient income to sustain themselves and their families. Tier Fund is a Christian humanitarian and development organization that works to end poverty and injustice. For the last four years, Tier Fund has been collaborating with African Evangelist Enterprise to implement the Sustainable Economic and Agricultural Development Project, or SEED. This particular project, Sustainable Economic and Agricultural Development, was building on the achievements of the Ending Poverty One Village at a Time, uh, which was a project also funded by the Scottish Government. The concept behind this was to actually work with poor people to move from uh, subsistence agriculture mainly and subsistence existence uh, into effective participation in the economy. The work has taken place in Gisagara, Huye, Nyamagabe and Nyaruguru district with the goal of reaching 30,000 households. Twakoze amahugurwa y'imisi 8. Niho rero twavuye dushyira mu bikorwa ibimwe mu byo twahuguwe. Ngiye kubera nahise mvuga nti nubundi muhamagara wange nari umuhinza ariko wahingaga gakondo. Nahise mfata kuguza amafaranga ya mbere nyagura icyo bitinyongera musaruro. umushinga wa sidi twabonye neza rwanda na wishimye aho waje gufasha abaturage bacu mu iterambere kandi bakabafasha mu kwike muri bibazo uwa ngo bakabanza bakiyumva bakisesengura bakamenya ibibazo bafite bakamenya n'uburyo bwabo nibura bakwiye gufashanya bakabisohokamo ko tujya tugira nibura ni kibazo kizuba no mu mihigo yacu ya karere tujya tugiramo ingingo y'imaryanye no kuhira kuhira kugira ngo nibura abantu boye ku depanda kumvura gusa ahubwo ni gihe imvura yabuze yabaye nkeya bwa buhinzi bwoye kudindira cyangwa se bwoye kwangirika seed has also uh, helped us to actually uh, mobilize communities to respond to environment and climate issues some have planted trees uh, bought fuel saving stoves Save the money and bought uh, solar panels. We just can't just hold it all. We can't look at it. We can't look at it because we're not in the mood to do it. We need to show us. We need to show us. We need to show us. We need to show The seed project has partnered with 1,500 self-help groups with a focus on women who make up 66% of the agricultural workforce in Rwanda. Ha gacuro ko murugo twari tuzi agacuro ko umugore w'icyo gihe kara ko gusasa no guteka gusa ibyo bateka babonye. Nabyo bidafatika bita bitari muri gahunda. Hari wa tukumva gakwa ari ibyo ntakindi twari tuzi. Umushinga wa AE waraje 
utanga matangazo basana bakankura mbaga b'amatsinda batanga itangazo ngo barashaka ko abadamu bafite ibibazo bahurira hamwe twagiyeyo turagenda duteranira ku mundugudu none ara tubwira bati mugiye kurema amatsinda ariko amatsinda y'abantu bahuje ibibazo bagomba kwicara hamwe bakareba ibibazo byabo bakayifatanya noneho bakamenya nuko bagomba kuzabikemwa bagiye gahunda yo guhinga je nkumva barambangamiye sinzabishobora ariko naje kugeramo bayanyigisha bukiye bukeya turahingana none ubu ngubu ndeza nta muntu ndusha kweza kuko ubu ngubu ndashobora ibigori bigera muri toni ibirayi ndagurisha ibiro 5563 urumva ko natangiye kubona ko nabwa buhinzi napingaga kageze bufite gahunda kandi nabyigishijwe niritsinda nta bandi bantu babinyigishije Excellent. Now that's quite a nice example of a practical on the ground response. Um, Philip, if people are watching that, what can they do to help with the self-help groups? I can encourage everyone to download the climate uh, toolkit that is there for helping you and your church to uh, know how you can make a difference. You can find out more about the well and the well that's hosting the event. And also, if you would like somebody from Tier Fund to come to speak at your church or at a youth group, we would love to join you there and share more about what we are doing, particularly as we seek to serve and accompany people in places like Rwanda who are making a tangible, material difference in places that are affected by climate change. Yes, excellent. Thank you. And um, now we have uh, another half an hour together of, uh, of time with our panel. And we'd like to get to some of the questions that you've been putting up um, in the chat. So we're going to turn now to a bit of an FAQ, kind of frequently asked questions come the time, uh, and um, run through some of these that have been submitted. And uh, I will put the question out there. If you've got something that you'd like to say, please do chip in, because they're not necessarily addressed to any one particular person at this point. Uh, but this one perhaps is more of a theological one uh, to kick us off here. So someone's asking that from what we've heard on the panel already, suggests that current and perhaps past theological ideas don't really work very well for our current context. Do we need new tools, new approaches? Do we need to be looking for new things in the Bible that can guide us at this point? What do our theologians think? Yeah, I don't mind taking that one. I'd say there are three things that are really crucial that we do need to do to help reimagine what it means to be Christian in the 21st century to deal with some of the cataclysmic issues that we're facing. First thing is we need to decolonize the Christian tradition. There is a lot of written material, audiovisual material, and even if you like music, I have a gospel album which decolonizes theology for you. For the folk who wanna get down, uh, we've made it accessible. So that's the first thing we need to do, decolonize it. What, what does that really mean? Looking at the way in which power has influence the way in which we interpret the biblical text so that we always marginalize particular people. So that's the first thing. Second thing is we just need to think intersectionally. Intersectionally just means that we understand that people are marginalized or empowered based on a collection of factors, race, class, gender, sexuality, age, ab ab able-bodiedness, all of these disability, all of these things impact on our capacity to either thrive and strive or be marginalized. So we need to read the Bible intersectionally we need to think about our christian faith intersectionally as well so we've got questions around decolonization questions around within the text in intersectionally and the third thing i would say that we need to do on on top of both of those two but it's related to the two of them is we need to acknowledge the way in which whiteness has radically corrupted understanding the biblical tradition what do we mean when we're talking about whiteness we're talking about a particular way of being in the world that emerged through the colonial enterprise and that whiteness has a radical impact on how people read the bible and understand christian theology in britain i'm going to leave you with two things here to think to ponder first i'm going to give you a resource there's a film that i made for the movement for justice and reconciliation in the summer called after the flood christianity racism and reconciliation Christi sorry, Christianity, slavery, and reconciliation. So on the Movement for Justice and Reconciliation website, 60-minute film, has some uh, uh, globally famous theologians talking about these issues and the way in which they um, um, present the, the material is accessible, but they talk about the way in which whiteness influenced theological thought and how we repent from that and reconcile from that 
today. So the first thing I want to deal with, deal with is just the resource. But what I'm saying ultimately, sorry, the second thing is how whiteness works. We know that whiteness is an issue because of the outcomes. British theology has over 800 people teaching in universities in Britain. Out of those 800 people, only two and a half are black people, two and a half. That means there are more black geographers out there than theologians. There are more black people in, and I know Grace would like that, there are more black people teaching in one department at Birmingham City University in sociology than the whole number of black people teaching theology in the university sector, sector within, within Britain. So in terms of output, it means that over the last 75 years since Windrush, white theologians have only produced two books that address issues of race and theology, two books. That means, you know, compare that to 50 books on being nice to animals, animal theology. And I'm not looking at animal theology, I'm just looking at the comparison. So we know it's problematic in terms of the output. So those are three key areas that people are working on. And if you, and like I said, with each of those areas, we've made films about them. We've even produced music to make it easy as well as written text. Decolonizing, intersectionality, intersectionality, dealing with whiteness are three powerful tools that can radically transform the Christian imagination, radically transform how we, the songs we sing about God, how we move in the world, and what kind of issues we're willing to engage with. Uh, Grace, I saw your little kind of <laughs> fist pump there. What brought, why, why, did you, why did we see that? What was it that, uh, that Robert said that got you fired up there? Yeah, just the need for more black geographers. Um, and just like, yeah, very, um, very important point of like um, intersectionality. And I loved Robert's point on um, disability um, because, you know, when it comes to like addressing um, climate issues, I was just like looking at theology um, in of itself. We don't really look at um, things like disability because, you know, most of us are able bodied. Um, and, you know, it's just been an honor just to have friends who, um, who are disabled and, you know, cut them, you call me out on like, you know, when I am pursuing um you know climate justice or theology through you know either if it's like my black lens or through feminist theology and um, being a black woman myself um you know just really um, addressing those things and that's what i really appreciate what i kind of like um experienced through my degree but with that i really have seen that you know when I, especially in my own cohort cohort i was the only black um black woman um studying geography and it's just one of those things where you know if you're not um getting more you know people of colour, you know, studying about the environment, studying um, theology, then how are we supposed to get these new um, ideas? How are we supposed to, you know, really transform the ways in which our congregation really, uh, you know, approaches these justice issues um, and really have an intersectional um, thought about it? Because, you know, on a Sunday service, most people don't really hear um, a sermon on environmental um, theology or how we can care for the environment or, you know, how can we actually make um, our church spaces more accessible, you know, do we have like um, services that do signing? Are we um, including people who are, you know, blind or deaf? You know, these kind of like issues we're not really um, kind of like addressing. So, you know, I was doing like a fist pump because like, yeah, absolutely. We need, you know, um, young people and also old people just really um, broadening out um, the ways in which we uh, use our knowledge to actually make things more accessible to people. Thank you. Um, we have another question here. Uh, can I, I just, we... sorry, Jeremy, can I just yeah, say one thing? Yeah as well about theology. I think what I'd like to add to this uh, excellent intervention from uh, Brother Robert and um, Grace is that um, theology doesn't come first. Praxis comes first. Do the right thing. L walk the talk. You know, what are you doing about racial injustice? I mean, I think we, 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 we are sometimes able to uh, talk about certain things, but have we have we actually practiced it and what, what is what is the theology that emerges out of practice i think that's the key insight of liberation theology you have to deal with it in the concrete realities of the moment and and face the injustice and name it and challenge it and and confront it and then your theology emerges out of it so i think unless we are willing to somewhere in our locality you know in, in where i live in cambridge face what's going on in the climate crisis, face what's going on in the racial injustice situation. It, it just otherwise becomes um, theory and even dangerous ideology. Yes, thank you. And 
one question that that's um that's come up here is um we've mentioned decolonialism and and words like that for a lot of people colonialism is in the past now um in countries are independent and uh i certainly i hear this from family members of my own um now that countries have independence surely they need to be taking more responsibility so how how are colonial dynamics still playing out why do we need to decolonialize i could see philip you, you were shaking your head there i'd write rightly so but tell us why uh, uh, i feel a bit emotional and angry and i'm trying to uh, stay <laughs> calm and uh, somewhat neutral in this conversation. But I'm angry because when the Second World War, when at the end of the Second World War, when, when international order was put back together, it was put back to serve the interests of the West. Even though the British Empire has ended in India, there is dependencies that go on in the international system. My background is in international relations. You know, I've studied geopolitics for over the last 500 years, and there is a fundamental unwillingness, a fundamental, and I think the only word you can use is the Christian uh, language of sin, uh, the evil, is that we don't believe in the fundamental solidarity of the human race. We refuse to accept that the life of somebody on the other side of the earth is as valuable as somebody in England or Germany or Canada or America. The, the, the Bible begins with this core conviction is God made all human beings in his image. And so the international system is fundamentally racist and remains um, colonial. It, there, there is new colonialism, even though colonialism has ended. So let's not kid ourselves by thinking because we have now um, uh, <laughs> Indians in, in power in, in India after 1947. I mean, when the British left India, uh, let's not forget that they handed powers to the Brahmins, who, who were very happy to run the country because they thought they were en entitled to rule. And the people from the lower caste in India have been the victims of the oppression from the Brahmins, historically. So what I think I want to say is that this is part of the fact that we live in a fallen world. You know, human beings are oriented away from God towards self and selfishness and greed and, and wickedness. And, and, and therefore, I'm not saying that some we look at salvation as some kind of pie in the sky that we'll have after we die. We believe that God's kingdom will come in history. We, we want to see change happen. And therefore, um, to just sort of think that now that India is an independent country and now we, we, we can sort of, our economy is growing, we've somehow um, escaped the system. No. We need to have imagination. We need renewed imagination to see how we, we build into the international system this conviction that every human life matters. I mean, in some sense, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights tried to capture that. But it's been a toothless uh, instrument. So I think I say that only because I think we have a great amount of work to be done. And what encourages me is when I see Grace and Jessica speaking with that passion and conviction, saying we refuse to accept the world on, on these terms. There is another way to do the world. And, and we need to be willing to put our lives on the line to see that change happen. Yes, thank you. I, I, I agree entirely with all of that. <laughs> um, you mentioned Jessica just now and some of the work that she's doing. Um, Jessica, I believe you're going to COP27, is that right? Yes, yes it is. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your your role at the conference and what you're hoping for from this conference in particular? Okay, um, so um, I'm the Global Campaigns Associate for TIA Fund and uh, I'll be the spokesperson for Africa uh, at COP27. So uh, for those that uh, may also not be familiar with COP, this is just a conference uh, that uh, leaders, world leaders uh, get to meet uh, to discuss issues concerning uh, the climate. And uh, now obviously, um, like from what we are, uh, obviously you can get a sense from how we are speaking, all of us here, uh, we can tell that uh, climate change it may be different in uh, different parts where we're coming from but at the end of the day all of us are being affected in one way or the other so uh cop 27 is being held in egypt this year that's why it's actually being called the uh, african uh, cop uh, so as i go i'll still um uh stick to what I've said earlier that I'm really hoping that uh, conversations this time around will really be uh, able to uh, blossom into uh, something 
that is uh, uh, realistic and physical, not just on paper, not just in, in, in conversations. And maybe uh, for some of us that like to make pledges and don't own up to them, maybe try and sanction us, please. Try, <laughs> try and, you know, uh, make us uh, be able to just uh, stick to them. So why I say so, I, I feel like sometimes it becomes like, like like it's a joke i mean people leave can, you can imagine we are trying to cut on uh, carbon emissions so much but people will fly like across the, the 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 continent across the world across get into one place sit down have conversations talk put on paper go back to their countries and meet again the following year you know without any uh sticking to that so i really hope that even as we meet uh this will be a place that really we're going to yield uh result positive results and also my hope is that young activists especially african young activists since this is uh, a cop that is literally in our backyard i'm hoping that we'll also get to have that chance like grace mentioned uh when we talk about uh, uh activists it really shouldn't be uh about a name one has made for themselves because at the end of the day i believe like the work is on the ground people that are doing much work there maybe their, their names are not even out there so i really hope that this uh uh will be um uh let let the table be open for both generations the older generation and the young generation the the thing that i i always see um as a young person that also gets to uh, hurt me to some extent is that i feel like uh there's only young people like oh we want young people uh, to 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 speak, want young people to uh, to do this and that, but you're going to bring the young people on the table and tell them what to go and say, which is not right. So if we are going to to bring the ideas, the young people, of course, we are talking about them being, you know, having the energy, having the time, having, uh, you know, uh, maybe even getting to be very familiar with the technology now and so on. So why don't you bring the experience, okay, the experience and the knowledge, the wisdom that the older generation has and incorporate that with the energy of the young persons, with the time of the young persons, and also with, with the knowledge of or technology of the young persons and put on one table and let us just try and see how best we can take care of this, uh, of our environment going further. A young person should not be brought on the table and told what to go and say out there, but get to listen to them. Okay, and also as young persons, I know there's this zeal, there's always this, you know, you, you really want to do this and that, but there's no harm in learning from the people that have gone before you. There's no harm in actually getting the experience and the wisdom from them. So all in all, I'm really hoping that when COP27 is done, when we go back and look at the actions that have been made, it's not just about talks. I really hope that the talks that are going to be made will yield into walks and that, uh, you know, we we'll all do our part in just trying to make sure that we leave this earth a better earth tomorrow because if we don't do our part i don't know what will happen 10 years from now i don't know if we're going to see the vegetation that we're seeing now i don't know if we're going to see to have the the sea life i don't know so let's just get to make sure that we do our part even as we uh will be having cop 27 uh this year in in africa thank you jessica I think that leads us on to a really important question. There's loads of questions that have come in and I'm afraid we're not gonna be able to get through all of them in the next uh, 10 to 12 minutes or so. But this one I think is really important and I'd love to hear all the panel's perspectives on this. Um, given these very serious issues that we've talked about, just a simple question really, but a practical one, how can I contribute to tackling this injustice? Grace, maybe you'd like to kick us off with that one. <laughs> I would have liked some more time to kind of like think about it because there's so many different ways and avenues um, and I kind of like thinking back to like what you um, wrote in your book um, about the kind of like different um, actions and like we can stand in solidarity um, and the different sacrifices that we can make um, which are voluntarily um, voluntarily made in comparison to um, our brothers and sisters um, in the global south who make involuntary um, actions that you know contribute well um, to you know, not contributing at all to the climate crisis. Um, but yeah, um, well, let's see. Well, obviously you've got individual actions, you know, um, cutting your carbon emissions, whether that be going vegetarian, um, but then there's also kind of like other ethical ways in which you can um, really stand in solidarity with um, 
people in the global south like i always like to bring um this one up of like you know um clothing like every single item of clothing that you wear is made by somebody who is made in the image of god who is loved by god and obviously the people who make our clothes are normally situated in the global south so obviously you know um as somebody who has purchasing power here in the global north um, I'm always very aware of like I want to invest in you know ethical clothing because I want to make sure that the people who um, are making my clothes are living um, really well and if they have you know um, money and living well then you know at least they'll have some kind of way to hopefully mitigate against the effects of um, climate change so kind of like thinking about things more broadly in the little actions that we make um, that's one of those but then also what we need is not just individual change we need systemic change I can't stress that enough and I loved what um, Jessica was um, talking about about um, kind of like older people versus like younger people like I really see how older people are somehow like passing the baton to um, younger people just a bit too early like you know we we need older people to actually make these decisions because like <laughs> they've got the power and yet they're like oh well you know it's the younger generation they've got so much zeal they've got so much power like yes you know we can leave it into their hands like no we don't but yet they have such a tight grasp um on like you know not wanting to change the systems that kind of like benefit them um so you know we just really need to stand in solidarity with the people who really want to actually create this systemic change you know really um get involved in various campaigns whether that be um you know tackling um the climate crisis with like the government um you know making sure that you know such as camp um, campaigns like stop cambo with all these kind of like new um, oil investments or even what um, the church is doing, you know, really trying to get um, divestments in that way or just making your church an eco church with through Arosha. There are so many different ones and I could just talk, talk, talk about it. But um, I'm aware that we've got so many different questions um, to possibly go through. But those are some of my few contributions. Thank you. Anyone else want to, to jump in with some specific things that people can do to help address this injustice? Yeah, uh, quickly, I think I'll start speaking like Dr. Robert Wood. I'll just have three things that uh, you can, <laughs> people can actually do. First, as an individual, reduce, reuse, recycle on an individual level. Then uh, people of faith, especially Christians, let's pray for the people in the front line. There are a lot of people that are suffering the effects of climate crisis. You have no idea. So let's just get to pray uh, for them and uh, make sure that, uh, you know, uh, we do our part to to try and uh, help them in adap uh, adapting uh, the situation and also mitigating. Then the third uh, one will be to the world leaders. You have the power. You have the resources. Use that power for the good. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. You may not have that power tomorrow. So when you have it, please make sure that whatever policies you put in place will not come back and bite you when you're not on that chair again. So make sure that you use your power to, uh, you, you won't please all of us, but at least please more than 50% of us and do right. So yeah, thank Those are my three cents on that question. Thank you. Anyone else on on uh, what we can do to contribute, either personally or as a society? Some general comments, not without uh, without going into sort of specific things that you can do, like uh, Grace was mentioning about Arusha. I think uh, a couple of things. Um, Gandhi said, "Be the change you want to see in the world." We have to live this thing. But I also think what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said was very important. He said, "You've got to sometimes um, put a spoke into the wheel of injustice. Sometimes you've got to say, take direct action." And one of the things that encourages me is what Extinction Rebellion are doing. Now, you can have a long de debate about whether it's ethical or unethical and all this sort of thing. But there are times in history when it is right to delegitimize an unjust system. There is a Christian justification for doing that. And so, therefore, of course, we need wisdom uh, to know when to do those kind of things. But there is a proper place to take direct action, to take action that says that we refuse to keep giving our uh, uh, consent to the people who are governing, who are be doing injustice. And the last thing I would say is um, do not give up on believing in the power of prayer. There is something that is going on in our world that is more than just what we see empirically. There is a spiritual dimension to all of this. Um, we read in Ephesians about God's desire that he would make the manifold wisdom of God made known through the church to the powers and principalities. Pray. There is something powerful about prayer because prayer changes us and it changes the world. In fact, uh, Walter Wink said, 
um, history um, is the, uh, um, oh, how do you put it? Uh, lost for the words now. It, it, it's like it's, it, justice is the answer to people praying. So I think I would mention those three things, Jeremy. I'm glad you mentioned Extinction Rebellion there because one of the questions that did come up was that uh, we do have some quite high profile examples in the UK at the moment of disruptive forms of protest. And uh, there are going to be people who are watching um, the, this discussion right now who feel quite uncomfortable about some of the techniques that are being used, even if they support the cause. And so there is this real matter for wisdom to know when it's uh, when it's okay to take direct action, how far do you go? What what are the right targets? You know, what is a legitimate form of protest and and what isn't? Um, I feel like if we open that that debate up now with five minutes to go, we we will get nowhere. But, well, I would, I, would, I would just chip in. I would just chip in and yeah, say, ahead. let's put this in within a historical context and think about how we have responded to similar things in the past. So within my lifetime, when Black South Africans started to disrupt the South African state. You know, British politicians here were calling them terrorists. You know, when we had the anti-apartheid movement across across Africa, you know, we we, we didn't see that as being um, legitimate forms of protest. Civil rights movement a bit later on wasn't seen as being legitimate. The the protest movements against violence in Northern Ireland at, at, at points where, where, were challenged when people marched down the streets with Bibles and signs of peace, you know, ended up um, um, being brutalized. So we've got a very poor history and, and, and um, uh, approach to understanding what is legitimate and what's not legitimate. Let's, let's start with that in terms. So, but I would argue that given the predicament that there are climate change refugees there are black and brown people who are dying as a consequence of what is taking place here and now. Biblical text tells us in John, if you see your brother or sister in need and you do not open up your bowels of compassion, how can you say you have the love of God within you? Well, I would say it seems to me that Extinction Rebellion have got a better handle on that than many Christian people, because if we see what's happening and the brutality and the continuity of the coloniality, then we have to do something. So I would say, I would venture to say that this is prophetic action. Mm. It's people speaking truth to power, challenging the way things are and engendering for many people on the underside of this real hope. Thank you. And um, I would say that if people do want to explore that in, in a little bit more detail, I helped to edit a book a couple of years ago from uh, Christian Climate Action, who are the Christians who are involved in the Extinction Rebellion. <clears throat> it's called Time to Act. It has a whole number of different perspectives and um, talking about the bible talking about history talking about these legitimate how, how legitimate are these forms of protest and I, I agree there are times when we have to take those radical actions and that's absolutely the right thing to do we are reaching the end of our uh, hour and a half together i think it's been a really stimulating debate i've really enjoyed your company and your wisdom um to to close then i would just like to remind people of the the self-help video that we saw and the project there that you can get involved in. Please do pray about that. Uh, pray about the self-help groups and for the work that's going on there. Let's let's all commit to pray, praying for Jessica as she goes to COP27 and is being a, a spokesperson there. Um, that's an important role that you have and we want to acknowledge that. Don't forget there's the climate toolkit that you can download if you want to put uh, this into practice in your church and um, work out how to declare a climate emergency and start doing those sorts of things in your church. And if you have questions that we haven't got to, please do book a speaker and um, the, the well can come and uh, can send someone your way who can answer all those questions in your community. Um, I think that's uh, all I need to say to wrap things up at this point, but- um, uh, Jeremy, I, I know you're very modest, but, I, but can I just add, Jeremy, Please buy yes, and read on. this book. I, I, I really think Jeremy has done a fantastic job with, with great humility, but also wisdom has put something in this book. Then if you haven't read this book, please buy and read it and get people in your church and get your pastor, your Christian youth pastor to read this book, because this is the book for our time. I, I really believe that. Thank you, Philip. I wasn't going to say that, but you've done it for me. <laughs> Let, let's finish this by closing in prayer. 
Father God, I was reminded of something Jessica said earlier when she talked about the table and let, let the table be set and the voices be heard. And it reminds me that you are a God that sets a table for us and that welcomes us all, that we all sit down in your presence as equals in the image of God, no hierarchy, no supremacy, all welcome in your kingdom. And we hold on to that vision, God, of a, a time when there will be equality and we will all be in your presence recognizing each other as the siblings that we are. We thank you for all that we've uh, spoken about this evening, difficult conversations that uh, will not be resolved possibly in our lifetimes, let alone tonight, but we place them in your hands, God. We long for justice. We long to play our part in that struggle for justice. Guide us in that, please, in our communities and in our own lives and our households. Thank you for everyone who's been able to take part in the panel and watching online Go with us and uh, we thank you for this time we've had together. Amen. Thank you all. We're out of time. Thank you finally to our panel and thank you for joining us this evening.